I'm uh, Lucia Masorova from uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Um, I'm going to give a little overview about the space and current happening in myelofibrosis, where currently we have a 4 jak 2 inhibitor approved in the United States, which makes it a little challenging to pick up the right drug for the right patients. And then what, what possibly future holds for us in the era of novel therapies, new developments and new science that's coming in kind of very speedy way to the field. We are all about excited this one. So, so uh, let me get started on the drug inhibitors in myelofibrosis. So you're probably all a little bit following. Those are drugs, they are approved for patients with myelofibrosis and advanced disease, such as symptoms, spleen, anemia, and, and basically improving the quality of life. And now new advances come in and also suggesting that they have also survival benefits. So we have four medications approved in a line agnostic fashion. So that means they do not have a designation when can they be used. And then the treatment choice would be on the physician and the patients in regard to what the disease need. So the longest approved is raxolitinib or Jacobi, which has been the drug that's been around for now over 10 decades. And that's still a very powerful drug inhibitor to be chosen as a frontline therapy for patients with large spleen and symptoms uh, because most of the US oncologists would have experience with these agents for the past decades. However, it's a medication that causes a myelosuppressive effect. So it does decrease the blood counts, particularly platelets and red cells, which is actually a very similar effect in the second approved drug inhibitor called fedratinib. So in both of those medications, we should expect lowering of blood counts, which could be treated by support, dose adjustments, as well as additional therapies or another choice where we could have another drug inhibitor, particularly for the anemia, the most recently approved called momelotinib or Ogera, which not only does work for spleen and symptoms, however, as well improves anemia through a different mechanism affecting hepcidin. So that medication might be a very good choice and it's actually having approval with indication of anemia, although there is no a specific cutoff or a specific anemia level or hemoglobin level. But that may be very compelling for patients to avoid transfusions, for patients with a lot of transfusion needs, for fear of transfusions because of other complications and so forth. So we have a head-to-head -head comparisons or direct comparisons between raxolitinib and momelotinib we showed the drug's efficacy for controlling spleen and symptoms, one and the other better for the other drug. However, in the anemia control, romalotinib is definitely better. On the other hand, raxolitinib has been used for years with additional therapies to it, such as erythropoietin stimulating agents, and other drugs such as thalidomide or steroids, which could also help and give patients a little bit different aspect if they are benefiting from that therapy. So that choice would be kind of coming more into the clinical practice scene, what patient will be best with what drugs, when to choose them, how to sequence them, and then what do we expect them in the next and next line. And then we have the fourth one, which is very beneficial and approved for patients with very low platelets called pacritinib or Vondra. So that medication is not causing any myelosuppression and it has also additional activities for different pathways where it could be beneficial for also controlling the inflammation in additional way or controlling the platelets in a better means. So uh, we're hoping that we will learn and, and we should learn how to sequence these medications better and how to combine them with other medications as well. That's an era that is coming. Currently we have witnessed the largest combination with raxolitinib, which is the first one that has been around. We had uh, recently published results or shown results of the large phase three studies that examined raxolitinib and placebo or raxolitinib and the, third, the second agent, which was either BCLX cell inhibitor called Navitoclax or a BET inhibitor, something we call Bromo domain called Plabresic. Both of those were recently released and showed significant improvements in symptom and in spleen control for both of the medications. 
However, not so much for the symptoms in an expected way. So that's something to learn. There are currently another ones, they are being a very, what I would call a hot topics in, in these days, which is combination of raxolitinib with another one called Solenexor, which is something we call an export protein. Pretty much all of these additional medications work on non-JAK pathways. So they are intended to inhibit the additional inflammatory pathways. They are activated in causing the JAK inhibitors not to perform ideally and also are responsible for disease progression ultimately. And then another one that is coming soon, uh, which is combining something we call MDN2 inhibitor. So one of the futures for myofibrosis fibrosis is gonna be a combination of therapy, JAK inhibitors and something else. I'm not particularly keen on, on taking one or the other. I would like to explore every single one of them in a combination, if safe to do so. Uh, we still have intention to, whatever drug started, explore the most of its potential by adding on something if it's safe to do. Uh, I would encourage to go look into clinical trials in the setting if they are open and exploring the novel approaches beyond the single agent, because all of us honestly believe single agents is not the future with these drugs. They're fantastic in controlling symptoms, spleens, prolonging survival, but definitely we can do better. And the better would be what will be the best next choice? What is the intention of the next best choice? It means what deeper spleen responses, deeper symptom responses matter more for clinical relevance, would they translate into longer survival, which is actually the most important outcome. And there we are having a new approaches or new drugs come in that would hopefully, which we'll not learn in the future, will address the disease pathogenesis even more and we'll be using more targeted approach. As, as you are aware, the majority of these patients would have activated or mutated JAK2, which is the JAK2 B617F mutation, as the most common in myelofibrosis in about 60% of patients. So currently, there are efforts of developing specific medications targeting this mutation. So JAK2 V617F mutation targeted molecules, or a uh, it's a little bit more broader, but targeting the JAK2 mutant clones, regardless of what's the underlying genetics. So those are entering the phase one clinical developments going in the first in human studies. Really huge excitements based on uh, preclinical data, mechanism, rational. And we are going to learn what the elimination of the JAK2 is going to show. Could we eradicate the disease completely? and shut it down and prevent it from progressing, which is actually our ultimate goal. Would be interesting to see whether that's going to have any role in combining JAK2 currently inhibition that we have. All of those are what we call JAK2 type 1. So they're not specific for the JAK2 mutation. They just shut down the pathway. So they are active in JAK2 mutant, JAK2 negative, and other pathways having patients with myofibrosis. So the question would be, could they be combined? To, to basically target the JAK2 specific one plus the other ones that we don't know how they play in and synergize. That's one thing. Of course, combination with others I just mentioned will be very intriguing to find out once we see what's the safety of these agents coming in. And then another very, very interesting um, and hopefully very near future bringing advances would be carlitically targeting. Because we, we know that about 30% of patients with myofibrosis carry carliticulin, which is a different mechanism of how the disease starts and how the disease works. Okay. It's actually an immunogenic patch that once it happens, the mutation happens, it is recognizable by the immune system on the surface of a cell. And we could, and we have worked with the companies to develop um, anybody to target that carliticulin to again shut it down, prevent it to exert the function on the cells. And in that effort, there are actually a couple different approaches. One, it's using a normal antibody, which doesn't have anything uh, attached to it. The other one is using something we call bites or bite specific molecules that are engaging also patients' immune system, particularly the T cells. That is, um, very well-known 
uh, mechanism that has been explored and used, and we have approved drugs across different hematologic cancers. So that's something that we're learning. And that study also launched and enrolled a couple of few patients already. And then a very novel mechanism is coming, uh, designing something we call CART, which are, which are, which are a specific um, chimeric antigen receptor antibodies. They are going to be also against the, the, the carleticulin and, and using a different mechanism of, of actually eliminating the, the, the clone and the mutant cells. So very... Um, exciting, very novel. Uh, we, we hope uh, that will actually help us to completely eliminate and eradicate the disease. We have seen use of um, bispecific antibodies and uh, cards against a different antigens in hematologic cancers. And they all actually meant a complete breakthrough where, where we have a cure patients uh, that, that would have had to go through a stem cell transplant or another very serious procedures or never could have even been cured because the disease was just so resistant. So, so we hope we finally um, get a little bit more advances and in understanding into the field, how, how the malignant clones actually do um, induce the disease and its progression, and then how we could hopefully stop it and revert it to induce uh, basically remission and cure. That would be absolutely fascinating.